Welcome to another episode of Eberhard Outdoors. This is a story of a buck I took in the year 2000. It is about a six and a half year old buck that was an eight point, and in my opinion, he had been the luckiest buck I had ever taken, yet by the time I took him, he was the smartest buck I'd ever taken, and I'm gonna tell you why. At the time, I had been bow hunting over 30 years, and in all those years, I had never encountered a buck as cautious in his older years as this guy. While I never name a buck like the TV guys do, they basically grow their bucks as if they're going to take them to a 4-H fair to win a ribbon. This buck did end up getting named by someone else due to his strange social behavior. This buck became known in my small circle of friends as Weezer, and he had very uncharacteristic social interactions with the matriarch does in his core area. I had been hunting from a modified two-panel Anderson tree sling since 1981, and it's almost identical to what is now the Eberhardt Signature Saddle sold by Tethered, uh, with some modifications. By this time, I had also taught myself how to properly care for, store, and use activated carbon line scent lock garments in conjunction with clean rubber or neoprene boots and a clean backpack to the point that I paid zero attention to wind direction when hunting. Our first encounter was in early October 1997. I was perched 25 feet up a large red oak that was in a tree line bordering a drainage ditch that ran north and south. The ditch was wide enough and mucky enough that it required chest waders to cross. To the east of the tree was a five yard wide buffer of tall grass that many years ago had been a tractor lane along the ditch and just east of the grassy buffer was a 40 yard or so wide patch of dense and tall red brush and east of the red brush was a large CRP field of weeds that were tall enough to hide the body of a walking deer. About 15 yards north of the red oak was a smaller oak and it had a primary scrape area beneath it with several scrapes and I had a clear shot to all of them. To the west of the ditch was a crop field that was in standing corn in 1997. As a side note, this particular section was likely the most heavily pressured private property area I've ever hunted in due to the number of 10 to 20 acre parcels with homes on them. Conservatively, there were a minimum of 30 bow hunters sitting in trees in that 640 acre section every opening day of archery season and likely double that amount of gun hunters on opening day of gun season and it was extremely rare to see a buck grow beyond two and a half years of age. Keep in mind, back then, very, very few people passed on young bucks, like they do nowadays. Just as it was cracking daylight, I decided to perform a couple of light sparring sequences, but the first sequence was all it took, as within moments I heard a deer moving through the dry cornfield in my direction. Within 30 seconds, a respectable eight point stepped out of the standing corn, stopped to look around, offering me a 10 yard broadside chip shot. While drawing my bow to take the shot, just as the cams rolled over, he spooked and ran down the side of the cornfield. At about 60 yards, he stopped and turned around to look back. And then within 10 seconds, he lost interest and went back into the cornfield. It was dead calm that morning and I had no clue what spooked him as he wasn't looking in my direction when I drew my bow and my scent lock suit was dead quiet. So he couldn't have heard me or caught my movements. Anyway, he was gone and I was upset because opportunities in this area for a buck I wanted to shoot just didn't happen very often. Wanting to know what could possibly have spooked this buck, once he went back into the standing corn, I drew my golden eagle bow slowly and while the cams were rolling over, one of the cams made a slight tick noise and he must have heard that. The draw length element was made of plastic and there was a small gap between the element and the metal cam and when it rolled over, there was a minuscule tick noise made when the gap closed and the element clicked against the cam. Not once during my previous practice sessions was that sound ever made. At the time, I had no clue as to just how much frustration this buck was going to cause me over the next several seasons. On a hunt from the same tree in mid-October of 1998, another hunter that also had permission rattled in a good buck just before dark. He had a carry light decoy out, which likely cost him an opportunity because the buck crossed the ditch with a doe 
from the tall weed field and stood on the edge and looked into what was now a picked soybean field. The doe walked out towards the decoy as the buck waded along the edge of the ditch about 50 yards south of the red oak. Does are more curious and tend to figure out decoys much quicker than bucks, and when she stiff-legged to within 10 yards of Doreen, she spooked back across the ditch and into the CRP field, and the buck went with her. When he described the buck to me, I knew it was the same buck from the previous year. Now, as a three and a half year old, he was a little bit wider, about a 16 inch inside spread, and still was sporting eight points. On an evening hunt during the late October pre rut from the same red oak, as the sun was setting, I could see antlers moving above the CRP weeds, and they were coming directly towards the red brush, which was towards me. As he entered the red brush, which by now had lost all of its foliage, I could tell he was the same big A point. He slowly moved through the red brush and stopped just prior to exposing his body into the grassy buffer, which would have given me a 20 yard shot. What happened next not only floored me, but it is also what gave him his name. The buck stood there like a rock, gazing into the pick soybean field for at least 20 minutes until it was just about dark and then for no good reason he let out a loud grunt snort wheeze. Now I've heard bucks wheeze on many occasions, but there were always other bucks around and it was for a show of dominance. This was for a different reason, and it had the most amazing reaction I'd ever seen at the time or since while deer hunting. Within seconds of him wheezing, three large does that had been feeding in the bean field crossed the ditch within 20 yards of me and started scent checking up and down the five yard grassy buffer between the red brush and ditch. They were so close I could hear them sniffing air through their nostrils in an attempt to smell any danger. It reminded me of bodyguards checking to see if it was safe for the president to get out of his vehicle. They never confronted the buck, but walked by him several times as if it were routine, and once satisfied it was safe, the does crossed back across the ditch into the beans. My cell lock suit, rubber boots, and clean pack had kept them from winding me or smelling where I had walked to my tree as they crossed my entry route several times. Unfortunately, it was now too dark to make out anything close except dark shadows, and I never heard or seen him leave the red brush. So as not to spook anything close with my departure, I waited for an hour and a half after dark before exiting my tree. All the way back to the van, I kept thinking how cool that experience was and that nobody was ever going to believe what happened. I was also excited to have a worthy opponent to brainstorm against, and from then on, he was known as the Weezer. On November 14th, the day before gun season, I hunted the red oak for the third time of the season and saw nothing, and I assumed it was because of all the pre-gun activity, as well as people sighting in their guns. This area is a shotgun zone, and I do not gun hunt, but I was told that during the gun opener, somebody had taken some shots at that buck as he was running across the CRP field with a doe. In 1999, the crops were rotated back into corn again, and on opening morning, two hours before daybreak, as I was walking down the edge of the standing corn towards my tree, I could hear bucks sparring across the ditch in the CRP field. As the bucks kept sparring about 75 yards away, I quietly ascended the oak and slid into my saddle. They kept sparring and taking long breaks in between, and as my eyes adjusted to the crack of dawn, I could make out Weezer having sparring matches with two smaller bucks. Shortly after daybreak, while the two smaller bucks were actually sparring, Weezer let out a long and loud wheeze, and the two subordinate bucks immediately broke apart and came back across the ditch and passed directly below me into the standing corn. Weezer slowly walked away and melted into the tall weeds, and later that morning one of the other hunters took one of the small eight points that had passed under my tree. Weezer was now four and a half years old and was still an eight point, but had grown to about an 18 inch inside spread. It was gratifying to see that he was still alive, but depressing to know how nocturnal he was beyond the confines of the tall CRP field, which is where he bedded as his sanctuary area. Michigan is a two buck state and the hunter that took the eight point had what we think was the next encounter with Weezer. He had set up in a huge red oak along the edge of a small marsh that separated the standing cornfield from a large woodlot to the south. It was late October by now and the pre-rut searching mode was in full swing. 
The woods to the south of the marsh had a lot of oaks, and there was quite a bit of doe traffic that fed through it in the mornings and evenings. It was dead quiet that morning, and there had been a hard frost the night before, and about 20 minutes before daybreak, he heard a deer crunching through the frosty marsh grass coming from the cornfield to the north. The deer stopped about 10 to 15 yards from his oak and was right behind him, so he sat dead still. He assumed it was a buck and that he stopped and staged to listen for other deer moving into the oaks after daybreak. He remained motionless until it was just cracking daybreak, at which time he slowly turned his head to see absolutely nothing. After hearing that deer move through over 100 yards of crunchy frost-covered marsh grass and leaves, the deer backed out without making a sound. We both felt positive that it was Weezer. He now believed what I had told him about this smart ghost of a buck because he'd hunted quite a few years as well and he couldn't comprehend a deer making that much noise coming in and then not being able to hear him leave. That was kind of astounding to him. It's very likely that the thermals took his odor downward and that the deer smelled him and spookishly backed out without a sound because in my opinion his scent control was suspect. He did not go to the extremes that I did using scent lock. In early November, I was back in the Red Oak for only the third hunt of the season as I didn't want to overhunt it and alter his routine. That hunt was a carbon copy of the hunt in 1998 that rightfully named him the Weezer. He came through the weeds, entered the red brush, stepped to the edge of the red brush, wheezed, and this time three does and a fawn left the standing corn crossed the ditch and ditto they sent check the buffer and it was dark again with nothing but frustration to drag out of the woods with my seemingly crappy hunting plan that was my last hunt for him in 1999 year 2000 a new century and hopefully weezer made it through gun season again which to me was highly unlikely for that area it's very difficult to hunt a large CRP field where the weeds are typically over a buck's antlers, even with a gun. My hope was that he lost some brain cells because so far I had not been a worthy adversary. The farmer strangely planted corn again, which I preferred due to the secure transition cover from the CRP field into the security cover of the standing corn or vice versa. At 4.30 a.m. on opening morning in 2000, as I was approaching the red oak, I spooked two deer standing beneath the annual primary scrape tree 15 yards up the ditch. All I could do was sigh as my flashlight beam crossed paths with Weezer as he hurriedly splashed across the ditch and disappeared into the CRP field with another smaller buck. Yep, he made it through another season, but damn, it was two and a half hours before daybreak and he was already staged at the scrape area. I reluctantly climbed into my saddle to take on the now morning task of basically bird watching. That evening I was in the tree again and passed up a two and a half year old eight point while awaiting another confrontation with Weezer, which as I knew beforehand would never happen after spooking him in the morning. One thing I couldn't figure out was why he continued bedding in the weed field when there was at least a hundred acres of standing corn to bed in with total security and no chance of danger with a transition because he would already be in the feeding area. This puzzled me because usually that much standing corn attracts the dominant bucks to bed in. Oh well, I thought he is not a typical buck and he is not gonna do what normal deer do. My next hunt was on October 21st. On an evening hunt, I decided to try and rattle him in as I hadn't performed a rattle sequence in that location the previous two seasons. As the sun was dipping beneath the horizon, I began the first sequence and within moments I could not only hear, I could also see the tops of the corn stalks wiggling as a deer was moving in my direction through the standing corn. I tied my rattle bag to my bow rope and lowered it to the ground and jiggled it in the leaves to give an exact location for the deer that was closing in the distance. When he reached about eight rows in where I could see his headgear, my anticipation stopped. It was a cute little six point and after a few minutes of looking, listening and sniffing the air, he turned and went back into the cornfield. As nightfall was creeping in, I heard a deer moving towards me down the ditch line. Could it be? Absolutely. It was Weezer and he was moving through the grass buffer towards me. There was still enough light to make a shot, but before he came within range, he stopped, wheezed, 
Two does came out of the cornfield, crossed the ditch, and started scent checking for him. After lowering my rattle bag to the ground earlier for the six point, I had tied a loop in my bow rope and hung it on one of my empty bow holders in the tree, and I forgot to raise it back up after that sequence was over. And of course, one of the does walked under my tree and winded the fabric on the nightingale rattle bag. She snorted, and that was the end of that. The reality of me ever taking Weezer was becoming very bleak. How could a buck that kept such a tight pattern and routine be so difficult to kill? The reason was obvious, as he never entered my small kill zone or the primary scrape area during daylight hours, or at least not on the days I had been there. I also felt that if that oak were hunted more than three or four times per season, that he would either find another entry location into the crop field or simply make the transition after dark. Also, there was just way too much other deer activity going on in that field for me to hunt that spot with any more regularity. On the evening of November 1st, 2000, I filled my first tag with a 131 inch eight point on a hunt with my son Chris, and that is another awesome kill story in itself because we both arrowed the same buck on the same evening. Thank God that on the next evening of November 2nd, there were 25 to 40 mile an hour wind gusts. Otherwise, what ended up happening never would have happened. For some reason that afternoon, I went a bit early and by 3 p.m. I was quietly settled into the Red Oak. Looking around, I couldn't help but notice that two of the scrapes had obvious wet spots in them from fresh urine, which meant something had been there very recently. Otherwise, the high winds would have dried it up. At 4.40, I about fell out of my tree when Weezer stood up in the red brush, looked around for several seconds, and then walked out of it with his antlers weaving through the brush. I ranged him at 41 yards, and as he moved at a slight angle towards the ditch, I drew my bow. I had anticipated this moment for so long that I had a momentary brain fart and thought about taking this very poor quartering forward shot opportunity. Fortunately, I regained my senses and let the bow down. The scrapes were fresh. It was obviously Weezer that had urinated in them and had staged nearby. I figured he would come down the buffer and work the scrapes, giving me a 15 yard shot. Of course, what you assume and what actually happens are typically two different things. Weezer followed the edge of the brush to get downwind of the scrapes, which would have put him directly downwind of me as well. Even then, I had enough confidence in my scent control regimen and my scent lock garments that the thought of him winding me never entered my mind. The opportunity I had been waiting for was finally coming to fruition. He stopped momentarily 20 yards from the scrapes, raised his snout in the air, and performed a lip curl to test the air. There was nothing of interest and he dropped his head and began moving towards the standing corn. It was now or never. I had spent four years and umpteen hours in preparation for this one millisecond moment that was about to take place. He crossed the ditch and at 35 yards was now quartering slightly away. I drew my Golden Eagle Evolution bow and made a vocal dome mat to stop him just before he entered the standing corn. I had a 35 yard pin and placed it just behind his shoulder opened my fingers to release a Carbon Express arrow tipped with a rocket sidewinder head and watched as it disappeared through his chest cavity. He wheeled and plowed back through the ditch and into the security blanket of the CRP field. I watched his antlers moving above the tall weeds for about 60 yards and then they took a nosedive forward and disappeared into the tall weeds. All of a sudden, I just let out this huge sigh of relief as if I had just accomplished some great task. I had great respect for this magnificent animal and because it was still early, I took my time loading up my gear and getting out of the tree. I didn't even blood trail him as I witnessed exactly where he went down, so I slowly walked up to him lying motionless in the tall weeds. I stopped for a few moments and took it all in as I was looking at him in front of me. There lay the most difficult buck to kill that I had ever or will ever encounter. I knelt down and stroked the hair on his chest, which was something I had never done before and have never done since. This is making me a little choked up. <laughs> During my bow hunting years, I've taken several bucks in which several hunting seasons were required, but never have I hunted a buck 
with such a strange social network with his core area deer herd. And that was so awesome at evading me. And I was soon to find out why he had been so smart and evasive outside the security cover of this large CRP weed field, which was his sanctuary bedding area. When I skinned Weezer out back home, he had a 12 gauge slug in his right rear quarter just under the hide. He had two double-lot buckshot pellets in his neck in the front. And he had a two and a quarter inch cut vortex broadhead with two inches of aluminum shaft and it was buried in his left front shoulder. The vortex head had entered above the right shoulder just below the spine before slicing the top of his left lung and getting buried into the shoulder. The broadhead was covered with hard cartilage and the wounds were all likely made when he was several years younger and a bit more promiscuous. I'm quite sure that whoever took the shot with that vortex head assumed that they had killed him, they just couldn't recover him. This was the third time I had gutted a buck with a collapsed lung from being hit with a broadhead. Something to think about is when you're hunting from a high elevation and you're taking a relatively close shot, the odds of a one lung shot are really, really high because you just, it's tough to hit both lungs from a steep angle. And it's a very high probability that if you one lung a deer, that he will survive. And many dog trackers, if you tell them you single lunged a deer from a severe angle, they don't even want to go look for it because their success rate on recoveries are very skinny. So I suggest if you ever take a shot like that with that severe of an angle to back your pin up into the liver area. Because if you hit them in the liver, you are going to kill them and you just have to give them a long period of time to die. That's just a little bit of uh, something to think about when you're taking those severe angled down shots. I assume this slug was from that hunter that took the pot shots at him as he was running across the CRP field with the doe. And obviously the buckshot was taken by somebody as he was walking towards them. Weezer dressed out at 178 pounds and while I have taken many bigger bucks with much larger antlers in Michigan and lots of them with much larger antlers from out of state, Weezer is hands down and by far the most rewarding buck I've ever taken. I want to lastly say every time I walk by all of my bucks at Jay's Sporting Goods up in Claire, Michigan, I always, always look up at Weezer and just kind of nod my head. I've probably taken 35 bucks that are bigger than him antler-wise. He's definitely the most difficult buck I've ever hunted and killed in my life. If interested, the links to many of the podcasts I've been on or for information about my two-day whitetail workshops that take place in March and April, please visit my website at d-e-e-r-j-o-h-n.net. Thank you for watching another episode of Eberhard Outdoors and to receive notifications for future videos, please subscribe.